theme of the book of Isaiah is judgment and salvation, and the title of tonight's message in chapter 28, and this is a communion service, is The Consequences of Ignoring God. I don't want to say that title again. Chapter 28 of Isaiah, The Consequences of Ignoring God. You're going to see tonight that God is going to speak very clearly to Israel. He's going to speak very clearly to Judah. They're both going to ignore him. And we will talk about the consequences. And because it is a communion service, the Lord is going to be speaking to us. He's already speaking to us. He's been doing it this morning in our morning devotions. And as we read Scripture and thought about Scripture throughout the day, sometimes out of the blue you just get that still small voice of the Holy Spirit where He's speaking Sometimes we're moving in a direction and he kind of goes, 
gives us a little nudge, you know, and he's, he's speaking to us. He's leading and he's guiding, and there are consequences when we ignore him. So tonight, um, hey, Steve, could I ask you, uh, uh, it's just me, it's probably, it's me, it's not you, but could we bring my voice down a little? Is it really loud out there, guys? And I'm not even really talking. No, it's just boomy. When I start preaching, it's going to get loud in here, so... <laughs> Thank you, sir. I'm just, I'm kind of in this weird COVID brain distraction again this week. So um, appreciate you, Steve. We are at another major, major transition in the book of Isaiah. The last four chapters, we were talking about the future. We were talking about the tribulation and we were talking about the millennium. And now what God does is he brings Isaiah back to his present And he says to Isaiah, I've got some things that I need you to do. I need you to speak to Israel and I need you to speak to Judah. Specifically, these next eight chapters, chapters 28 through 35, are really directed primarily towards the southern kingdom of Judah. But God will also begin by speaking to the northern kingdom of Israel as an example to Judah of something not to do. And so beginning at chapter 28, verse 1, I want you to notice the first word. It is the word woe. The word woe, it it appears six times in the next eight chapters. And I want to talk to you about this word before we jump into the text. Those of us who study the Bible, many of you already know this, but the word woe is the Greek word ho-e. Ho-e. And if you take the time to really dig into the scriptures and you take the time to dig into the meaning of this Hebrew word, what you find is that it's kind of defined as a lamenting threat. And let me explain that. I want you to picture God when he uses this word woe or Jesus in the New Testament when he uses the word woe. Picture God with this broken heart warning his people that if they continue in a certain pattern of living, he will be forced, he will have no choice but to discipline them. And if the discipline of the Lord does not bring about repentance, then he will be forced to judge them. And so this section, chapters 28 through 35 of Isaiah, is commonly called the woes. Some scholars call it the woes of Isaiah. And it's because these eight chapters, God is speaking to his people through Isaiah, and he's speaking to the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, that it's time for them to confront certain sin patterns in their lives. And if they don't recognize these sin patterns and repent, turn from them, there's going to be discipline and judgment. God promises that if they repent that he will forgive them, and it would bring about restoration. But God also promises that if they rebel instead of repent, that God would have no choice but to bring judgment in unexpected ways. And you and I, we have the gift of hindsight. We know that neither the northern kingdom of Israel nor the southern kingdom of Judah responded to God the way he wanted them to. They didn't repent, rather they rebelled. And so shortly after what we're reading tonight, just three years later, God sent the Assyrians to come and to lay siege to and then completely conquer the northern kingdom and carry them off as captives. And then later on we'll see that the southern kingdom, the exact same thing happened but it was the Babylonians. And so right off the bat, we have this warning that when God is speaking to us about certain patterns in our lives, sinful patterns, we as human beings have a tendency to kind of get this idea of, I'll get around to that later. You know, God's not really as serious about this as maybe we think he is. And the message that Isaiah is going to give us tonight is that when the Lord speaks to us about patterns of sin in our life, we need to be quick to repent. We need to do it very quickly. And so, this is how we're going to handle this. Chapter 28 is broken into two, chap- two sections. The first 13 chapters, first 13 verses 
are directed towards the northern kingdom of Israel. And we're going to study those, and then we're going to go back, and we're going to make practical application that's going to lead us to the communion table. And then we're going to study verses 14 through 29, God's message through Isaiah to Judah, and then we're going to go back, and we're going to make practical application that's going to lead us to the communion table, and then we're going to worship a bit, preparing our hearts, and then we're going to celebrate communion. And, and it's my heart, my belief, that God's going to speak very clearly about certain things tonight, and, and there's going to be a lot of action taking place in this room, spiritual action. God's going to do a lot of work here tonight. So verses 1 through 13, we have here God's warning to Israel. And God is going to begin by confronting the northern kingdom of Israel but you need to know this. He is doing this so that when he gets around verse 14, he can say to the southern kingdom of Judah, don't do what Israel did. Don't listen to my warnings and then do the exact opposite. So, notice verse 1. Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which is at the head of the verdant valleys to those who are overcome with wine. So here in verse 1, Isaiah's words are directed to a very specific group of people. Notice the crown of pride and then also of Ephraim. So you know this by the time we've gotten here in Isaiah. I know you've heard this about a dozen times, but Ephraim was the prominent tribe of the northern kingdom of Israel. And so often in the prophetic writings, God refers to Israel, the northern kingdom, by the name Ephraim. So whenever you see Ephraim in the prophetic writings, we're talking about the northern kingdom of Israel. And then notice Isaiah begins by speaking of the crown of pride. This is referring to the capital city of Samaria in the northern kingdom of Israel, and to her civil and her spiritual leaders. So God is speaking to Israel as a kingdom, to the city of Samaria, and to the civil and the religious leaders. And I want you to notice that this first woe here in verse 1 is directed specifically towards the drunkards of Ephraim, and as you go a little bit further, to those who are overcome with wine. And so the people of Israel, along with the civil and the spiritual leaders, were involved in a very, very serious sin that God calls drunkenness. And what God does is He confronts them. And the reason that He confronts them is found beginning in verse 2. Notice here, Behold, the Lord has a mighty and strong one, like a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, like a flood of mighty waters overflowing, who will bring them down to the earth with his hand. The crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, will be trampled underfoot. And the glorious beauty is a fading flower which is at the head of the verdant valley, like the first fruit before the summer which an observer sees. He eats it up while it is still in his hand. Now let me explain those verses that we just read. At the time that we are reading about here in Isaiah chapter 28, Israel was living under the constant threat of the Assyrian invasion. God had already said and prophesied, the Assyrians are going to come and they are going to destroy you. The thing is, is that the Assyrians were already nearby. The Assyrians were already a, a real threat. They knew that the, the day of judgment was coming. But here's the interesting thing, is that at the same time that judgment was so imminent, the northern kingdom of Israel was experiencing this season of incredible prosperity and blessing from the Lord. And, and there's a lesson there. How many of you have ever been in a season where you knew you were living in out-and-out out rebellion to the Lord, and in His goodness, He continued to bless you? Anybody ever been there? Well, that can be a little bit confusing because the, the carnal mind says, well, listen, if, 
if God didn't approve of what I was doing, why is he being so good to me? And Paul answers that when he writes to the Romans. He said, it is the kindness of God that leads a man towards repentance. So oftentimes, we'll be involved in some kind of a sinful lifestyle, and we think that because God continues to bless us, and he hasn't let the hammer fall yet, that God just approves of it. And that's just a a carnal way of thinking that shows that we don't understand the character of God. God is so good. But a day of judgment always comes. So here's Israel. They're being blessed. Judgment is at the door. And instead of living in this state of self-examination, they were rather numbing the pain of the coming destruction through, notice what we have here, drunkenness. They were feasting, as we'll see in the latter verses of this section, and they were drinking, as we'll see in this section, and God sends Isaiah to say that when his judgment comes, Assyria's effect on them would just be total destruction. And as we just read under there, Assyria is going to trample them underfoot. He says in verse 4 that the glorious beauty, that's speaking of the thriving blessings of the land of Israel, well, it's becoming a fading flower. In other words, her glory is about to disappear. And so anybody in the room tonight, if you're in that phase of life, You're just thinking to yourself, you know, I know I'm doing things I shouldn't be doing, but God doesn't seem to be, you know, doing anything negative to me. My business is thriving. My family is thriving. You know, I just got a promotion at work or, you know, I just got a new car. It just seems like I think God's okay with this. We need to learn the first lesson from the nation of Israel, and that is that it is the goodness of God that leads a man towards repentance. The very fact that He has chosen to bless you, even though you've chosen to rebel against Him, just shows you how much He loves you. How He wants you to practice self-examination, leading to confession of sin and repentance, to bring you to that place where you agree with Him that this thing is not good for you. And so, drunkenness had caused Israel's civil, that's the governmental leaders, and then the spiritual leaders to fail miserably at their God-given role of leading the people. And so here in verse 2, Isaiah warns the nation of Israel that her sin is about to be judged. He says, Assyria is not going to only attack. She is going to trample you people underfoot. She's going to trample the leaders underfoot. She's going to carry them away captives. They will be naked and ashamed with hooks in their jaws headed for wherever the Assyrians are going to carry them off to. It could have been various places. And she is going to turn your fertile, beautiful, blessed land into a barren wasteland. And there's a lot of lessons there For those of us who maybe know God is speaking tonight about a change. Look at verses 5 and 6. These are very interesting. And most scholars believe that that this is a dual prophecy. Whenever you see that phrase in verse 5, in that day, in the prophetic writings, you're usually reading about what we call the day of the Lord. That time after the rapture with the tribulation and the Lord judging the earth. But it also has an application to Isaiah's day, and and we're going to focus on the application to Isaiah's day because we spent two weeks talking about the day of the Lord. So notice in that day, this is the day that God judges Israel by sending the Assyrians, the Lord of hosts will be for a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people, for a spirit of justice to him who sits in judgment and for strength to those who turn back the battle at the gate. We'll just cover this in a way that it really fits what we're studying tonight. But I want you to notice that Isaiah speaks about a remnant. And we know that whenever we read about a remnant, we're, we're talking about a group of people who, in the midst of everybody else around them rebelling against God, they have chosen to remain faithful to God. They're the ones who have been faithful to God as the nation of Israel goes astray. And on the day of judgment, They're going to sit back and they're going to say, I'm not happy 
that the Assyrians are here. I'm not happy that I'm watching myself and other people being carried off captive or killed or worse. But they are saying this, God told us this was going to happen. And even the judgment of God upon us brings glory to his name for a couple of reasons. It, it promises and it fulfills this idea that God is always faithful to himself. And he's faithful to two things here in this text. Number one is his character. As we read throughout scripture, we find that God is both faithful and he is, what's the other word? Just. He's loving and he's just. Just. And one of the things is that we always get these things out of balance. When you're involved in sinful activity, we are so focused on the lovingness of God, aren't we? You ever hear people say, well, why would a loving God judge me for just doing what feels so natural to the way he created me, right? We get so out of balance. And then when we're talking to somebody else about their sin, well, we get overly focused on the justice of God, don't we? I remember my pastor used to quote this song, and we looked it up online one time. Um, it's old. It's like from the 70s or the early 80s. And it's one of these Christian variety show type of things, but the host of the show is up there doing this country gig, and it's, God's going to get you for that. God's going to get you for that. And then this whole thing, and then he comes around, God's going to get you. The whole song was about God's going to get you for that. And you know, when we're talking about someone else and their sin, isn't it great to be able to say, well, God's going to get you for that. And it usually backfires. You know, when we're trying to get away with our sin, eventually the justice of God comes. Or when we're judging other people, it's so frustrating when God blesses them with a promotion and a new car, isn't it? But God proves in the judgment of the northern kingdom of Israel that his character stands at all times. He is faithful to be loving and he is faithful to be merciful, yet at the same time, he would not be God, and he would not be able to call himself God if he was not also faithful to judge. And then the second thing is that God is always faithful to his word. He told Israel through a warning from Isaiah on multiple occasions that judgment was coming, and when it came, it proved that God is always faithful to his word. So let's now jump into verses 7 and 8. Notice Isaiah says, but they also have erred through wine and through intoxicating drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through intoxicating drink. They are swallowed up by wine. They are out of the way through intoxicating drink. They err in vision and they stumble in judgment. And there's a lot here and I hope that I can cover this accurately. Isaiah is saying that the spiritual leaders and the civil leaders in the northern kingdom of Israel had erred. They had, cre they had uh, committed a great error. And Isaiah gives an overview of, of what it is. He says that they have erred through intoxicating drink. So the leaders, including the spiritual leaders, had become just like the people. They, they were no different than the people that they were governing. They were drinking to the point of intoxication. And I want you to notice a couple of phrases that Isaiah uses here as he's describing how the priests and the spiritual leaders and the civil leaders had ignored God's word. And he says that they allowed themselves to get swallowed up by wine. And this is definitely a play on words because when you drink wine, what do you do to it? You, you swallow it. And the whole idea is that Isaiah is saying, when you drink wine, you swallow it. But when you drink too much wine, it swallows you up. When you drink a little bit of wine, you're in control. When you drink too much wine, it's in control. And that's what Isaiah is using this word picture. They were swallowed up by wine. They are totally under the control of alcohol, which led them to being, notice this phrase used a couple of times, out of the way. And, and what that means is that they have been led astray, and now instead of being leaders, they are wandering. But because they're wandering, people are following them into error. And so Isaiah gives some details now. And he begins to tell us how it affected the leadership of the civil leaders and of the spiritual leaders. Notice he says here that they err in vision. 
And so the spiritual leaders specifically were giving false prophecies and they were delivering false teachings because they were under the influence of alcohol while they were doing their ministry. And then notice, they also stumble in judgment. And so they were giving unbiblical counsel, unbiblical direction. When a big situation came up and they needed to provide good leadership, they couldn't because they were under the influence of alcohol. And it gets even worse. Look at verse 8. For all tables are full of vomit and filth. No place is clean. Ooh, that's graphic, isn't it? And this is what Isaiah is saying under the direction of the Holy Spirit. He's saying that the priests and the civil leaders were participating in these drinking parties and these feasts where people were getting so drunk and, and eating so much food and just doing all these things that were beyond the level of self-control, that they're literally vomiting on the tables and then still picking up food off the tables and eating and vomiting on the tables and drinking up their wine cups. Isn't that just gross? And, and see, this is, this is how the Holy Spirit works. He says, I want you to see things the way God sees things. And, and when people who are called to lead other people, especially spiritually, are doing it under the influence of drugs or alcohol or any other thing, it creates a terrible terrible problem. And so beginning in verse 9, Isaiah records the way that these spiritual leaders responded to his rebuke. So picture there's been a gap of time. Isaiah comes and he rebukes the leaders of Israel. God sends him with his word. And Isaiah brings the word of God. And now we have the response of these civil and spiritual leaders who are given to too much drinking. Verse 9, they're speaking now. They say, whom will he teach knowledge? And in whom will he make to understand the message? Those just weaned from milk? Those just drawn from the breasts? For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. So this is what's going on. Isaiah came to them And he brought them the word of God, precept upon precept, and line upon line. So obviously he was a Calvary Chapel pastor. (laughs) He, He came to them, and instead of just, you know, giving them topical studies about their particular sin, Isaiah devoted himself to teaching the word. And he brought them line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, precept upon precept. And they turned around and they said to him, Isaiah, what you do is too simple. Um, Like, they're using words in the Hebrew that kind of give this idea of, Isaiah, you're teaching people the ABCs of religion when by this time in life, you should be eloquent and you should be giving these moving speeches. Isaiah, you got to take a class on preaching. Right? And what's interesting is that they are insulting him. They think. But you know what they're doing? They are giving him the greatest compliment they could have ever given. Because this is what God told Isaiah to do. And I believe that this is what God has told me to do. And anybody who handles the word of God. Now when Easter comes around, you do a topical message, right? When Christmas comes, we do a topical series. Every once in a while we do a series on prophecy or something like that. But listen, if you are going to lead people... And you're going to do it effectively with the Word of God. You teach line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, precept upon precept. That's the way God has designed His Word to be handled. And as we'll see in the book of Acts in the next couple of weeks, what ends up happening is we get to give people the whole counsel of God's Word. And I don't know if you've ever been in a church that doesn't do that, but I know this is that the pastor is always going to teach on his pet peeves and his pet subjects, right? Church finances get low, he's going to do a series on money. You know, he sees something going on in, in the world, he's going to do a special series that, that, that deals with that. But I have found this, this is the most amazing thing. I will be teaching from like Isaiah, and someone will come up after the service and say, I just cannot believe how clearly God spoke to me tonight about my personal finances. And I'm thinking... There was nothing in this text about personal finances. You know, and I just say, well, praise God that he spoke to you. 
because he speaks through his word. It's just so amazing. But they responded by insulting Isaiah. And they come along and they basically say, you know, Isaiah, I think you're in the wrong business. You should probably go talk to Claire and serve in the children's ministry. Maybe the nursery. You know, something like that. But Isaiah, you are not called to be a preacher. And they must have really offended God. Because when we get to verse 11, God is now speaking. God steps up to not only defend what Isaiah had done, but to speak a word of judgment to them. Look at verse 11. For with stammering lips and another tongue, he will speak to this people to whom he said, this is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. Yet they would not hear. Let me say that again. Yet they would not hear. But the word of the Lord was to them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and caught. God says to Israel, he says, you people have really blown it. He says, I sent Isaiah to you. And in the midst of this coming destruction of the Assyrians, he came and he spoke to you the way I told him to speak to you, line upon line, precept upon precept. And he gave you two things. Look at verse 13. He said that they, oh no, I'm sorry. Look at verse 12. He told them about the rest with which they might have as weary people. You people are weary from your sin. You're weary from worry. And Isaiah has come to tell you where you can find rest. You can find rest in the Lord. But you ignored him. And Isaiah told you where you could be refreshed, but you would not hear him. So what does God say? He says, you wouldn't hear Isaiah, but you know what you are going to hear? You're going to hear the voice of the Assyrians. And those Assyrians are going to come and they are going to wipe you out. They're stammering lips. They speak another language. And another tongue. That's what you're going to hear. Because you refuse to hear my word as Isaiah brought it to you. And then look at the last sentence here. That they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and caught. God said, had you heard my word, you would have fallen forward on your knees in repentance and I would have forgiven you and restored you. But you ignored me. When the Assyrians get here, you know what's going to happen? You're going to fall backwards in judgment. You're going to be broken. You are going to be snared. You're going to be caught. You're going to be carried away. And again, we just see it over and over in this section that we're studying. God's going to give his word and he's going to say how you respond to this is going to determine how your future goes. And unfortunately, for Israel, this was not good because true to his word, three years later, it's believed that this was written in 725 BC, three years later in 722 BC, God sent Assyria to be his hand and his instrument of judgment towards the northern nation of Israel. And so they should have listened, they should have responded, they should have repented, but they didn't. And now what I want to do is I want to talk about God's warning to us. And in these first 13 verses, what we saw was that Israel was using alcohol to numb the stress of the impending Assyrian invasion. And this entire section was written, if you look back to the first couple of verses, to those who are overcome with wine. And I want to bring some balance to a subject that I think for a long time, and especially probably more so in American churches than other parts of the world, I think that this subject of alcohol has been grossly mishandled by the church. Um, have you ever heard the phrase that, that oftentimes the response to a thing is worse than a thing? Have you ever heard that phrase? I believe that that might be what happened in this realm. And I'm going to need you to hear me out on what I'm about to say. I'd like you to turn to Proverbs 23. It'll take me quite a while to get there. But Isaiah is condemning the fact that people in important positions of leadership were turning to alcohol. People in the community were turning to alcohol because they knew trouble was coming and they were numbing themselves instead of dealing with what needed to go on. They needed to turn to the Lord. Instead, they numbed themselves uh, 
with alcohol, and then it turned into a lifestyle. Even the priests and the leaders were doing that. I I saw something today. I'm going to verify this, so don't hold me to this. But I read today that the highest level of alcoholism and per capita, the highest level of alcohol sales is in Washington, D.C. I mean, if I had that job, I don't know how I would sleep at night either, right? Can we cut that from the recording? <laughs> I'm just joking. I want to give, I want to give some balance. And, and again, I really need you to hear me out. Because as you search the scriptures, you never, ever, ever find God saying to his general people, thou shall not drink wine. Just the opposite takes place in, in a lot of scripture. In fact, as you read Genesis 27, wine is referred to as one of the prosperous blessings that God would give to his people Israel if they obeyed him. In the Old Testament poetic books, we read about wine as a picture of merriment. And it's interesting because that's further illustrated in the New Testament because Jesus' first miracle was turning water to wine at a wedding, a, a, a time of merriment, a time of celebration, a time of feasting. And there's great, great symbolism in that study. You can find that on our website But it's interesting because he also drank wine at the Last Supper as part of the Passover meal. And the very fact that Jesus was called in a negative way a wine bibber at least shows that while he was performing his ministry and he was in public, he drank wine. If he didn't, they wouldn't call him a a wine bibber and a glutton. And so in 1 Timothy 5, Paul writes to Timothy, And he talks about the medicinal value of wine. Psalm 104.15, if you read that whole section surrounding that, it says, number one, that wine makes the heart merry, and it implies that used in moderation, wine is a gift from God. And so again, you need to hear me out completely because we're not serving wine in our communion service tonight or anything like that. But we need to have a balanced understanding. As you study the first few times that wine is mentioned in the Bible, you realize something very, very important. And that is that man, apart from the leading of the Holy Spirit, has a tendency to take these things that God has given to us as a gift, and he wants it to be used for good. But then man uses it in excess. Man finds ways to use it selfishly or for evil. I mean, and just off the top of my head, the first couple of times that wine appears in the Bible, you've got Noah coming off the ark, right? You've got him planting a vineyard, and then he drinks of the fermented vineyard, probably never, nothing, you know, fermented before that, we don't know, but he gets drunk, and then while he's drunk, his son does something very, very inappropriate to him. Then we have the story of Lot's two wives. They want to have sons because their husbands fell under the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. And so they get their father Lot drunk and they take turns sleeping with him and they father two sons which became two nations. So you see even the first two times that wine is mentioned in the scriptures, you see how men took something that God gave for good and used it for evil. But the Bible does not condemn drinking wine. It strictly condemns drunkenness. And we need to make sure that we live and think and communicate and talk to people in a biblical manner. Because oftentimes, what's being condemned is not what the Bible condemns. Drinking wine, nowhere in the scriptures is condemned. But continually, drunkenness is condemned. And I think we're all familiar with Ephesians 5.18. Look up at the screen for a minute. Ephesians 5.18, Paul says, Do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation. Dissipation is a word that just kind of describes the fact that you lose all your inhibitions, right? You just, things you would have never done if you weren't drunk, you would do. Read some statistics today, and if you think about things like date rape, If you look at statistics surrounding date rape, 
over 70 some percent of women who were the victims of date rape and over 50 percent of the men who committed date rape admitted to being under the influence of alcohol or drugs when they did that. Um, it's illegal to drive a car in our nation under the influence of alcohol. Why? Your judgment is impaired. Your reflexes are impaired. You're probably going to think you're Mario Andretti and go racing around corners. You're going to wreck. You're going to hurt somebody, right? And so Paul says, don't be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. It, this, this is a, an, an or thing. Don't, don't be drunk with wine. Rather, look to be empowered and filled with the Spirit. Are you at Proverbs 23? I want to give you some insight as to why Paul might have used this word dissipation. I personally think that Paul was thinking of Proverbs 23 when he wrote this. He says in 29 of 23, Proverbs 23, verse 29, he says, Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Now he answers. He says, those who linger long at the wine. It's important to see those two words, linger long. The people who are drinking too much. Those who go in search of mixed wine. Do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. At the last, it bites like a serpent and it stings like a viper. Verse 33, your eyes will see strange things. Your heart will utter perverse things. And then jump down to the end of this section, verse 35, the last sentence. It talks about the effect that a person has after all this that we read, you know. Just let me kind of think about it. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? He's talking about who went out and got drunk and woke up with a black eye and doesn't even know how he got it, right? Who got in a fight with his wife and can't even tell you the next morning why, right? He says, this is what happens. He drank too much and he did things he should have never done, normally would never have done. And then look at verse 35. What does he say? When shall I awake that I may seek another drink? He says, here's the issue. Either you're in control or the wine is in control. But both cannot take place. And this is why God prohibits drunkenness, because drunk people harm themselves. Drunk people harm other people. They harm their family. They harm their nation. It's a serious problem. It has always been a problem. It will always be a problem. And as we go back to Isaiah chapter 28, I just want to show you one other thing. I want you to look at, I didn't write down what verse it is, so I have to look back here. I want you to look at uh, the end of verse 1. Look at the end of verse 1. Oh, I did write it down. It's right there in my notes. Look at how verse 1 defines drunkenness. It, it defines drunkenness as someone who is overcome with wine, overcome with alcoholic drinks. Overcome. You were once in control it has now taken control. And if you study that word overcome, it's very, very interesting. It, it talks about being overcome in a very negative way. And, and so looking at the screen, we'll end this and we'll keep moving through Isaiah. In 1 Corinthians 6.12, I think Paul gives us a very, very important principle, excuse me, one of a few that we should learn when it comes to the Christian and alcohol. This is probably the most important. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 12, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. He says, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. And so I think this is where liberty comes in. This is where the Christian has to look at his life and say, do I have the liberty, the maturity, the level of control to where I can drink an alcoholic beverage, and not lose control. I, I made a list of some things that might give us perspective because, you know, sometimes as Christians, we want to just convince ourselves that everything's okay when maybe it's not. I wrote a few things. I said, if a person finds himself needing a drink after a tough day, that falls into the category of drunkenness even if you don't get drunk. Because according to what Paul is saying is that... You, 
Something is controlling you. In order for you to come home from a rough day and take the edge off, before you can face the wife and the kids, you've got to stop you know, for happy hour. Paul says, you're in the realm of drunkenness. You're no longer in that place where you're exercising a liberty that is actually a blessing in your life and not a curse. A couple of other things I wrote down. I said, if a person finds themselves unable to control their use of alcohol, that's drunkenness. I could stop anytime I want. I just don't want to stop. Right? We've all heard somebody say something like that. This is where we have to say, hey, I think that maybe this was something that I used to control and now it has started to control me. What about this? If I cause a brother to stumble, then I'm no longer acting in love. I use this example a lot. What you do in the privacy of your own home and what you do in public are two totally different things. And you could say, hey, I've... I haven't been drunk or depended on alcohol in the last 30 years of my life. But last week, my wife and I went out to celebrate birthday or anniversary or something like that. We thought, you know what? We're not going to run into buddy. Let's order a glass of wine. Let's have a beer, whatever it is. And no sooner do you do that than someone that you know who has a terrible struggle with alcohol and knows you're a Christian walks up and they see you drinking and all of a sudden you realize, I just exercised my liberty and it's causing my brother to stumble. He's walking up saying, hey, you're always talking to me about Jesus, but this doesn't fit. You know that I have a problem with alcohol, and here you are in public drinking. And so these are the things that we have to think about. And then one last one. If you have to use alcohol to numb the stresses of life, you're in the realm of drunkenness. You're not in the place where you can come home and just say, wow, You know, I'm having a glass of wine with my wife. It's great. I could take it or leave it. When the stresses of life require you to come home and have a drink because you need to numb yourself, Isaiah would say, you're no longer exercising a liberty. You are in bondage. And so I wanted to bring balance to this because God's warning to us is simple. Do not be under the control of anything whether it be alcohol, whether it be comfort food, whether it be prescription drugs. One of the big ones these days is medical marijuana. It's pretty easy to get a medical marijuana license these days. I don't know, does South Carolina have that? I don't know if we have that. I know a lot of other states do. But you got a lot of people, and I'm just going to be honest, they're just stoners. And they get a medical marijuana license, and they say, yeah, i got pain in my back. So, you know. It's so easy for us to deceive ourselves, you know. Go to the doctor and say, oh yeah, I got pain in my back. Can I get another refill of the, you know, the oxy or something like that? Isaiah is saying, listen, you've crossed some lines. And I think the New Testament, the Old Testament is so clear, we have liberty. But we never exercise our liberty in a manner that brings us into bondage. Now let's look at God's warning to Judah and then we'll talk about communion. We get now verses 14 to 29, and and God is now going to warn Judah. He says, therefore, and that links us back to the first section. God is saying to the southern kingdom of Judah, pay attention to what I just said to the northern kingdom of Israel. He says, hear the word of the Lord, you scornful men who rule this people who are in Jerusalem. So Isaiah is now speaking to the civil and the spiritual leaders in Judah. And to paraphrase, What he says is, he says, look north, look at Israel. God sent them a warning, they ignored it, and they perished at the hands of the Assyrians. Do not make the same mistake that they made. And so now Isaiah confronts the sinful attitude of the people in Judah. He says, because you have said, we have made a covenant with death and with Sheol or the the grave. He says, we are in agreement When the overflowing scourge passes through, it will not come to us. For we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood we have hidden ourselves. I know that's a little bit hard to understand. But Isaiah goes to the leaders of the southern nation of Judah, and he says, Folks, God has already told you that judgment is coming. But you have deceived yourself in various ways. One way is you made an alliance with Egypt, And you think because you and Egypt are now friends that when the Assyrians come, that you guys are going to hold them off. When the Babylonians come, you have nothing to worry about. 
And notice this phrase here, it says, it will not come to us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood we have hidden ourselves. The leaders, even the prophets, were lying to the people in both Israel and Judah, saying judgment isn't coming, judgment isn't coming. And Isaiah is saying judgment is coming. And the people chose to believe what was easy instead of what was biblical. And so needless to say, they also ignored God's warning. They refused to repent of their sins. And they have this false sense of security, and they've got no fear of death. They're saying, Isaiah, you keep telling us that the Assyrians are coming. You keep telling us that the Babylonians are coming. And you know what, Isaiah? We haven't seen anybody come. Therefore, we don't think we've got anything to worry about. And isn't that so much like the world that we're telling about Jesus? How often do we talk to people and they're like, you know, my grandma talked about Jesus coming back and her grandma talked about Jesus coming back and guess who has not come back? Jesus has not. And people get this false sense of security. You know, everything's going to be just fine. But it's interesting because in 605 BC, Babylon fulfilled God's plan and God's promises when she laid siege to Judah. And it took a number of years there were different waves of captives led away, and then when the time was right, they leveled the city. They turned it into a wasteland. Verse 16, therefore thus says the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily. Also, I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plummet. The hail will sweep away the refuge of lies and the waters will overflow the hiding place. In contrast to the false security, Judah begins to pass on this idea that they've got nothing to worry about. They begin to ignore Isaiah and he reminds her that God has a sure foundation that we can build our lives on. It's called his truth. Later, Peter quotes a lot of this chapter when he's speaking of Jesus as being our precious cornerstone. Talks about him being our sure foundation, that he's a tried stone. This is, this is Isaiah saying, listen, there's a messianic promise and it's coming, but now, he says, what you really need to trust in is, is the solid foundation of God's word. and What he says is going to come to pass. And they said, hey, we've got, we've got nothing to worry about. I like this, that Isaiah speaks into the future and he talks about Jesus. He's the foundation, the tried stone. He's the precious cornerstone. He's the sure foundation. And you and I, he's the only one that we can build our life on. If we trust in anything else, we are going to experience judgment. I want you to notice here, we're, we're talking about the building of a building. Isaiah says, Let's talk to the people about something they'll understand. They had a temple. And when the temple was built, they used certain tools. They used what we would call a tape measure. And they used a plumb line. They wanted to make sure that everything was just so. And so building on that picture, Isaiah says this. He says, I will make justice the measuring line. I will make righteousness the, the plumb line. He says, you cannot get away from the truth of God. You cannot get away from the righteousness of God. And since you guys have rejected, look what he says. The hail will sweep away the refuge of lies. And the waters will overflow the hiding place. You see, the false prophets and the people who are giving false security, their promises were going to be washed away when the attack came. And notice the, the, the word picture. The hail will sweep away the refuge of lies. The waters will overflow the hiding place. Isaiah just says, listen, I know you believe something. But if what you believe is a lie, then when judgment comes, you're going to be under that judgment. And how important is it for us? We've been talking so much on Sundays about coming here and being equipped for the work of ministry and then walking out the door and being able to talk to people and when they say, well, let me tell you what I believe. For us to be well-versed, studied up enough to be able to show them that what they believe 
It might be scholarly. It might be philosophical. But it's not biblical, and it's not going to get them into the kingdom of God. And to be able to communicate that in a loving manner. Look now at verse 18. He says, your covenant with death will be annulled. And your agreement with Sheol, or the grave, will not stand. I like that. Isaiah basically says, so you've got some pretty solid beliefs, huh? You believe that your covenant with Egypt is going to keep you from the wave of violence that's going to run through your city. I'm glad you believe that. But I need to tell you, you believe a lie. That is not going to happen. Your covenant with death going to be annulled. Your agreement with Sheol, it will not stand. When the overflowing scourge passes through, you will be trampled down by it. As often as it goes out, it will take you. For morning by morning, it will pass over, and by day and by night, it will be a terror just to understand the report. I think our takeaway from that is that just as Isaiah was able to dismantle what they believed and then tell them judgment is coming. We also need to be well-versed in what other people believe. We don't have to be experts, but we have to know the Bible well enough to be able to take apart their argument and still lovingly show them that if they cling to what they believe, when the ultimate judgment comes, they are not going to find themselves in God's kingdom, but swept away in the judgment of God. That should be part of our evangelistic outreach. And so the chapter ends with Isaiah giving advice to those who are heading into judgment. Two little parts here. He says, for the bed is too short to stretch out on, and the covering so narrow that one cannot wrap himself in it. For the Lord will rise up as at Mount Perizim. He will be angry as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his awesome work, and bring to pass his act, his unusual act. Now therefore, do not be mockers, lest your bonds be made strong, for I have heard from the Lord God of hosts a destruction determined even upon the whole earth. The focus is in that first verse, verse 20 right there. For if the bed is too short to stretch out on, and the covering so narrow that one cannot wrap himself in it. This is what Isaiah is saying. If you laid down in a bed that was too short and too narrow, and the blanket was too small to wrap around you, how much comfort would you have? Zero. Isaiah says, the things you believe in are a bed too short, too narrow, with a blanket that won't cover you. Isaiah says, you need to stop having security in something that is going to lead you to judgment. Just as you cannot be comfortable in that bed, you should not be comfortable in these false beliefs you have, because God judged other. He gives a couple of examples of past judgments that God had performed. And then he says, just as he did that, he's going to do that again. And then verse 23, and I just have to say this, just add this. Isn't it great as a child of God to have perfect and complete security in just one place, Jesus Christ? To be able to, if someone just comes and says, well, what is it that gives you that security, that peace? It's the person. It's Jesus. My faith in his finished work. Yeah, but you still sin. That's what makes him so good, is that he didn't require me to be perfect. He just required me to be in him. I love that. And now the end here, and this is, really pay attention to this. Really pay attention to what Isaiah is saying. He says, give ear and hear my voice. Listen and hear my speech. Really, Isaiah is saying, pay attention because this is good stuff. He says, does the plowman keep plowing all day to sow? Does he keep turning his soil and breaking the clods? When he has leveled its surface, does he not sow the black cumin and scatter the cumin, plant the wheat in rows, the barley in the appointed place, and the spelt in its place? For he instructs him in right judgment. Let me read that maybe a little bit more clear. For God instructs him in right judgment. His God teaches him. For the black cumin is not threshed with a threshing sledge, nor is a cartwheel rolled over the cumin, but the black cumin is beaten out with a stick and the cumin with a rod. Bread flour must be ground, therefore he does not thresh it forever forever. 
break it with his cartwheel or crush it with his horsemen. This also comes from the Lord of hosts who is wonderful in counsel and excellent in guidance. I know that was a lot, but I think you saw some patterns in there. And and this is what Isaiah is saying. He's saying, pay attention to the way a farmer prepares his field and brings it to harvest. Does he plow every single day, 365 days a year? No. He plows, and then he breaks up the soil, and then he levels the field, and then he plants the field, and then he waters the field, and then in time he harvests the field. Then after he harvests, he threshes in order to separate the wheat from the chaff. And then he takes the weed and he grinds it into flour and eventually he has the finished product. He has a plan and he works the plan because he knows the plan works. And then he says something else. He says, listen, once you've got these little plants growing, do you drive the cart across the field? No. He says when you're threshing out black cumin, you use the right tool. And when you're threshing out regular cumin, you use a different tool. And this is what Isaiah is saying. He says, pay attention to how God works. God has a plan. And in your life right now, he may be plowing. In your life right now, he may be leveling. In your life right now, he may be planting seeds. He may be watering seeds. He may be running off the birds. He may be weeding the field. He may be getting ready to harvest He may be grinding the wheat so that he can make bread. He always uses the right tool at the right time because he has a perfect plan. And this is Isaiah speaking to the southern nation of Judah saying, could you just trust the God that is perfect in all his ways? Wherever he has you right now, he's got you right there because you're in a small season of a big plan. And he's saying, Judah... The Lord, right now the Lord, has you right where He wants you. And if you stick with His plan, good things are ahead. Identify your sin. Repent. Get back right with God. And you'll find that down the road, that harvest of righteousness is going to come. But unfortunately, that is not what happened. They rebelled against the Lord and judgment came. And so we've talked about a lot tonight. And what we're going to do right now is, is we're going to pray, and we're going to worship, and then I'm going to read to you from 1 Corinthians as we prepare our hearts for communion. But listen, tonight we've talked about so much, and even if none of the specifics applied to you, the generalities must, because we're all the same. Tonight, if, if your issue is you got some substance abuse problems, identify that God has a plan For you to overcome that. Maybe you're on the other end of the spectrum. You've got some legalism problems. And you tend to judge people who exercise their liberties. Maybe tonight showed you that that you're out of bounds. Judging people for exercising certain liberties. Maybe you don't have those liberties. But you're not allowed to judge them. That's not loving. Maybe tonight you're frustrated with God. Because you don't understand why he's got you where he's got you. Isaiah said, just hang in there. He's got you right where he wants you. Whatever the Lord spoke to us tonight, whatever he ministered to us, we need to bring it to the foot of the cross. We need to self-examine. We need to confess. We need to start that process of repentance. And we need to be able to approach the Lord's table tonight in a joyful, joyous manner. Because we've been brought into alignment with His will and with His Word. So, Father, tonight we've covered a lot of ground in this one short chapter. Isaiah has really, really revealed in this chapter the heart of man. We have a tendency to ignore Your Word. We have a tendency to ignore Your messengers. We have a tendency to numb our fears, and it could be drugs, alcohol, comfort food, hobbies. It could be so many different things. You've identified tonight the fact that 
we tend to listen to what we want to listen to. One person says that judgment is coming. The other says God would never judge a person for that. And and we listen to the wrong voices. We look at our life circumstances and we second guess your love for us. We second guess your direction, sometimes even your ability to get us to that harvest of righteousness. By your Spirit, you spoke things to people that we didn't even cover tonight because He was at work here. And as we sing this song right now, Lord, we are going to remember that the source of all trouble is the human condition called sin. The solution for all this is the perfect Son of God sent from heaven to earth who lived a perfect life in our place, died a substitutionary death in our place, rose from the dead and gave us this promise that if we would put our faith in His finished work, the eternal consequences of our sin would be forgiven and we would never face them. And then, Lord, You gave us this promise that You would begin to transform us into the image of your son Jesus day in and day out. You do it very slowly, Lord, not nearly as fast as we wish it would happen. But you promised us, Lord, that day in and day out, you were going to transform us. We've been reminded tonight, Lord, of things to turn away from. We've been reminded tonight of things to run to, cling to. And we just pray, Lord, as we prepare our hearts for communion, that you would just continue to speak, that we would be obedient to hear, that we would not fight you, we would not resist the Holy Spirit. We would receive grace upon grace as we draw near to you tonight.